Good morning, everybody. It is a Friday, April 3rd. We're glad you're back with us uh, another week. Uh, good morning, Penny. Good morning. I'm uh, looking at gray skies and incessant rain. This is day two, which is making me crazy because I walk my dog two or three times a day and I don't like to go out and he doesn't like to go out in the rain. It just feels like stop. 24 hours of rain the last two days. Would this be a bad time to say 70 degrees, not a cloud in the sky? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I live in the mountains. But we have more rain. We have more rain coming Sunday and Monday. So, yeah. um, so maybe we start by talking uh, about notebooks. I'd like to share one thing that I've been doing in my notebook. You know, we're now on day 15 of this little daily uh, meeting and gathering uh -huh. of mine, and so I have started a two-page spread in my notebook in which I am around the edges of it, I'm capturing interesting things that some of our guests have been saying. Things like, curiosity is the most important characteristic of a writer, John Warner. Education is not worth much if it doesn't make your life better, Chris Crutcher. Um, I teach for kids who are defiantly alive. Uh, Dulce, uh, Flecka, um, embrace the fact that you will create bad art, Micah Borne. And so um, as we're having these daily conversations, uh, I'm spending a little time and I'm just kind of collecting those nuggets of wisdom uh, as we go through this, uh, I hope, once in a lifetime uh, event together. How about yeah. you? Well, it's interesting because when you showed that picture, I thought that's off Padlet, right? Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I, I thought I'd mention to everybody is that I've had two people post on our Padlet. And I even have the settings set so that they can't post without permission, but they're getting through. And I remove them if they're posted anonymously, just because I do not want to take the risk that it's going to link people to something that's not good, even if it's titled as something good. So um, I would prefer people um, send me a message if they want to post something. but. Um, I, um, have been struggling quite a bit in my notebook. I find that one of the reasons I write so much is that I can go back and sift through my entries when I'm looking for inspiration. And so I had written while Micah was talking yesterday and I ended up writing next to some of the things that he said, um, which was good, but I didn't get very far. And I, um, I'm feeling a little frustrated. I need I need to get focused on writing and I'm getting distracted by a whole lot of other things. Well, you were talking about that Jacqueline Woodson post today, right? Yeah, it was a couple of days ago, just where she said that she was overwhelmed by everything. It was on Instagram and I can so feel that um, everyone, you know, I was thinking about this. Do you know how we always say, well, I wish I had more time. And all of a sudden we have so much time and it's getting harder and harder to use that as an excuse with anything. And so I have like my files from the high school that are in boxes in the basement that I haven't gone through. And part of it was the grieving process of leaving the work and the kids that I had been with for so long. But the other is that I just have been on this crazy rabbit, you know, like running around on a wheel. And so now that I have the time, I've gotten through one drawer and I have another one that I need to get through and then I'm going to tackle the basement. So it's things like that, making, carving out time to try to do. And so writing practice is truly that as well, right? Avoid it. Get your butt in the chair every day is the key, right? right. Uh, an hour day is the key. And I, I, like you, have been distracted, of course, by the events and family issues and trying to make sure my extended family is safe. And I yeah. you know, I really, my heart really goes out for those teachers out there who have young kids at home and who are trying to balance, you know, all of it under one roof. It just seems really, really insurmountable to me. And so um, I'm hoping that this half hour a day, 20 minutes a day offers a little respite if there's time uh, for that to occur. Uh, for teachers. Also, like you, I'm, I'm, I kind of do this up and down as far as mourning the loss of my school year and the loss of my kids. Sometimes I'm really good with it and sometimes it sneaks up on me and that conversation with that kid I will not have again. Uh, I was asked to be the graduation name reader. That's not, you know, so these little moments of realization of loss 
our, you know, seat back and, and, and kind of jump up here and there. Yeah. Um, so we were going to talk about poetry today and, um, we are first going to talk about the criteria, right? That's the part you're going to start with. I'm going to share the screen here. So I would say first, uh, that, um, before we jump into that, this idea that in 180 days, we, you know, wove a lot of poetry in. And in the book we're writing right now, one of the admissions that we've come to, one of the realizations that, that has occurred to us is that although our kids read a ton of poems in 180 days that year and every year since then, uh, we feel like we maybe dropped the ball a little bit and that we didn't create an entire unit, standalone unit on poetry, that it deserves its place at the table alongside narrative, argument, inform and explain. And so um, we have since created an, a poetry unit, which we're going to share with you next week. But we thought as a little tease today that we would talk about when we get into this unit, there's two things that we want our kids to look at, uh, uh, two criteria for judging poetry. The first criteria is this idea of what are the technical moves uh, and techniques that are employed by a poet. In a poem, uh, a comma is extraordinarily important. Of course, what's so beautiful about poetry is that so much more is often said in such a small space that every word, you know, a poem is decision laden uh, with, you know, moves that the writer has to think about, uh, technical moves. Uh, and if we want kids to be able to discuss poetry and to analyze it and think about it and, and talk about it, they have to acquire the academic language of poetry. And so you and I have used this appendix uh, from or, or lexicon from Nancy Atwell's book, uh, the second edition of The Reading Zone. And I know Nancy has given us permission uh, to share this and given you permission. I, I believe it's still posted on your website. Is that correct, Penny? Yep. And so we use this as we're going to take multiple laps around poetry. Again, we'll talk about that next week. But as we begin warming kids up to the idea of poetry, we're going to start to look for opportunities to have discussions where we can infuse the technical element of it. The okay. second before, element, wait, 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 wait. Can yeah, I just yeah. pause? Because well, in all that you explained, I feel like that's what what most poetry teaching looks like. And I think that the thing that's different for us is that we ask them not to be able to name all those moves by any, by any account. No. You know, we're, they're not looking at all of them, but also that we're trying to get them to understand them, to use them. There's always this connection between, you're not just studying someone else's moves, you're practicing and trying the move. I think that's a key difference comes back to reading like a row, like a writer, but this time being applied to poetry. Right. Right. And then the second element, which is a little harder to put your thumb on, is this idea of the effective part of poetry. Does that poem touch you? Does it touch your heart? Does it touch your brain? Uh, does it stimulate your brain? And so, um, of course, we want kids to look at both of these elements, but, um, that they're not unrelated, right? If that poem has somehow connected to your heart, it's because the writer, the poet, did something. It might have been that metaphor. It might have been that pause. It might have been, there's, you know, I don't know. There's something, there's a move there that then connects here or here. And so when we're looking at poetry, and do you think this is a good poem or not, these are the two elements that we want our kids to consider. Yeah, however, I like how you said that. Yeah. Yeah. So, however, before we even go down that road, I think our first mission is really, really, really just to get kids into the poetry door, uh, it, you know, to warm them up to the beauty of poetry and just to kind of transition them in ways that I think they will, that you think they will discover and, and raise their engagement and enthusiasm for poetry. Yeah, and I think, you know, I was um, lucky enough to hear Naomi speak at Booth Bay more than once. And what I've always loved about um, 
her, she's a poet and she's lived as a poet her whole life. So what I like about this is she said there's something that happened along the way with poetry. And I think it, we could say it happened along the way with teaching, reading and writing. You start thinking of a measurable substance and that students are supposed to demonstrate if they get it or they don't get it. But she says, sweep that out of the room and create a sense of love. What you don't need for the teaching of poetry is to feel as if you're an expert. And if we just paused right there, that's why I caution against, you know, with the lexicon, going to too many obscure terms or moves that kids aren't ready to make themselves. You know, the power of sensory detail is huge across all, content, all um, pieces of writing, but in poetry, it has such an impact. And that's something that kids can get their hands around. So she ends this quote by saying, um, you do have to find places of real love within yourself for lines, for topics, for ways of writing, for styles that will help you create a mood and atmosphere where poetry becomes contagious. And so in order to create an atmosphere in a classroom where poetry is contagious, and I, you know, I have pictures in these next few slides of students in an elective class I taught at my high school on poetry. And our entire English department was electives from 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So it wasn't that it was the only one, but what I found was that kids who had failed other courses um, by their guidance counselors were pushed into poetry. And so what we thought was gonna be a one section, in fact, my department chair said, no one's gonna take this, kids don't like poetry, became three sections, four sections, because, um, all of these students were like, okay, I'll take that. But you have, to, you have to develop this sense of confidence in kids. And I think that that comes from play and practice and ungraded practice, as we both have said. So two ways I'm gonna share today that help my kids play. Um, the first one, Spine Poems, was early in the year, right the first week of school, I asked kids to go out and make a poem from the titles of books. People do this um, all over the place. I've seen them on Twitter. but um, what I loved is that the revision is natural. You're just moving books, but you also, with a partner, create a poem. These two girls, heartless, new boy, trickster in my father's country, in the land of invisible women, God help the child. And I was like, oh, you know, you can say something. I love it. But the second um, way I want to think about play is what I began calling a lyrics mashup. And it came to me... Um, just like out of nowhere. I was thinking about line breaks and I was thinking about um, Dave Matthews music and I love his songs and I had a bunch of his, um, the lyrics to songs on my desk and I started putting them together and I had so much fun with it that I decided to ask my kids to do this. And so when we begin this hour together, um, my students and I, I would say, this is all we're thinking about are line breaks. And that's, you're gonna create something new because these are three songs written by a favorite artist of yours in front of you, but you mix them up to create your own poem. And these elements, I've got five of them on there, um, are the ways that line breaks help us um, feel and imagine and, and live inside a poem. But the secret is play because the poet reads and rereads and adds punctuation or takes it out or adds a phrase or repeats a line based on this. So then I turned them loose and they printed out, most of them had brought these with them because they knew we were gonna work with lyrics the next day. And they sat there often by themselves but sometimes with others nearby and just looked at words, and if you moved one line, what did it do? Caused so much, I mean, deep, deep engagement. My classroom was so overcrowded with all these kids, and they're, you know, that half table in the back where you got three kids crowded around it, they were still spreading out those lines, sharing them, talking, talking, talking about what they loved about these different words and phrases. This guy I just adored, and he had four Garth Brooks songs. He was like, can I use four? I love these so much. And then he sat there working with these lines for an entire hour uninterrupted because he was so engaged with making something out of that work. What are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking, first of all, how that moves away from the, the idea of everything has to be measurable substance, right? Um, I too have done this. Well, first of all, let's back up to the spine poetry. The first thing I thought there was, 
what an interesting also way to get kids deep into your classroom library. Yeah. And you have to physically hold, I mean, in a way it's almost sort of, you know, furtive speed dating of your books uh, and getting books in your kids' hands. So I love that idea a lot. Mm -hmm. um, although I have to say it makes me a little crazy. How am I going to put all those books back in the proper place? No, 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 they put them back. You don't put them back. <laughs> oh, they're, they're going to put them back in the proper places. Okay. I see. I see how that works. Yeah. Uh, but, and you know, I, I too, um, have done the mashup. I did, I don't know, uh, with that on, can you see me still? Um, this is what I'm going to do so they can see you better is stop okay. the share and yours will pop up. Um, so, speaker view. um, my, yours, your favorite mus musician is Dave Matthews. Mine's Jackson Brown. And so in my class, um, I took three of his songs these days, sing my songs to me and for every man. And I did the same thing in class with my kids. And I have to say, it is one of the most engaging hours and it is such a good way to get kids into the idea. You know, they don't really think of music as poetry, a lot of my kids, you know. Yeah. Or they, they think this poetry is this kind of real rigid English class thing. And sometimes it is. And by the way, there are classic poems I love to teach. But mixing in, and we'll get into that next week, but mixing in, uh, you know, contemporary stuff like Micah, who we interviewed yesterday, uh, and, and having kids do that. Did, did you have kids ask you if you could mix artists? Um, I didn't. I didn't, but I did have kids. One of my girls came up and said, I want to make a poem of every Taylor Swift song she's recorded. And I was like, well, I appreciate the ambition, but it <laughs> will be very hard to take five, you know, albums of music. Um, the other thing that I, that I wanted to say about that, when you talk about that engaging hour, that is the perfect opportunity for us to confer with as many kids as we can. And that's what I loved about it is I could sit beside and go, why did you put these together? Talk to me about this. What are you thinking about it? And the kids are, and we always say that it can be hard to confer with kids unless they're deeply engaged in what they're doing. And this is such an opportunity to get to know them. Like, who do you love as an artist and why? And what are you trying to create? And not only get to know them, but have them get to know one another, because mm -hmm. this presents another opportunity for meaningful collaboration, a kind of collaboration that I think builds community in the classroom. I didn't know you like Dave Matthews. I, you know, and how many things do you learn about your own kids when you're collecting these or reading these, or they're giving you permission to read them, that that little quiet kid likes the same artist that the old man teacher, you know, it's crazy some of the connections that are made that come out of this assignment. Well, I was thinking this fall, Connor, who I used Dave Matthews as an example, showed him my notebook and he goes, oh my God, have you been to the Gorge? And I was like, three times. He goes, 2016. I'm like, I was there. He's like, I was there. I was like, what? <laughs> Which was so much fun. It like changed our relationship the whole semester. Yeah. It's yeah. so true. Yeah. So Well, just that idea, I think, of light, getting kids lightly into poetry in a way that I think excites them is, is a much better approach than starting with, let's look at the glossary of terms, everybody, and let's get started. Well, because I think that what you started with, the um, technical aspects of a poem, so I took just one, the, the idea of a line break, and gave them lots of play with that one term. And my students would take that um, lexicon in their writer's notebooks during this study. And so we would color in, just like you would on a word wall if you're an elementary teacher, we studied line break. And I want you not to forget that this is how we studied it and the things that we were thinking about with line breaks, but to not overwhelm them. There's a lot of terms here, we're not gonna get to them all, but I want you to just think about this and it's gonna be a repeating um, word we use to talk about how poetry is constructed. That's interesting because that just sparked a thought that I didn't bring into this conversation. And that is, you know, a strategy that I've done in the past is I've given them a poem by an established poet, but I, I take out all the line breaks and I make it just a paragraph and without any clue. And I ask them to, to go, okay, can you match the decision-making that this poet made in trying to break the lines and seeing if you can make, and then of course there's a big reveal at the end. This is, this is the poet's decision making. How does yours compare and match up to that? Yeah, I love the idea of giving uh, students the opportunity to break it apart 
I've also done it with a passage from a young adult book. Turn this into a poem. Where would you break the line? What would you eliminate? Mm. How would you take this? And you know, the big idea thinking to a small space. Big idea thinking okay. to. Since we're in the brainstorming mode, uh, this is not a poetry exercise, but this reminds me. Sometimes I'll get this is a this is a editing exercise. Uh, a correctness exercise, but I'll give them a passage that's completely all the punctuation removed, mm -hmm. right? Completely removed. And now here is the, the, the paragraph. Now, can you put it back together the way you think the author did? And it makes them think about, you know, the use of the semicolon, the use of the, the you know, intentional run on the intentional fragment, that kind of stuff. The, the art of crafting a really interesting paragraph. But Again, bringing that in this case to the poetry side of things, not yeah. from a correctness point of view, but more from, you know, should this be an in jam line or should this, you know, uh, should yeah. the line end, uh, you know, and so getting kids to kind of think about the play of that. Yeah, so we had, well, at least this is what I was thinking is that that's the weekend activity if people want something to distract them to create something in the notebook that takes three songs from an artist they love and weaves them together and even though all of us probably don't have pictures with the artists we love kelly gallagher <laughs> that <laughs> you raise the stake a little too high for me but um i could take the language that i love and play with it which would be a nice stress reducer i think i have to put a picture because I can't draw like you can. Oh yeah. I would love to have a picture with Dave Matthews. Somebody out there, connect me to Dave Matthews. <laughs> Make that happen. So you want to tease a little bit of next week? Well, I'm super excited. Monday we have Chad Everett joining us um, because we've been trying to connect all of what we're doing to what leaders let us do. You know how we've, you and I have been blessed to work for many leaders that were supportive when we would come in and say, can I pilot this? Can I try this? I'm wondering about this. I'd like to address it like this um, to let us deviate from standard curriculum. And how does a leader best support the teachers in this building? Well, I got to spend two days with Chad in February at Horn Lake Middle School in Mississippi, where he's an assistant principal. And he taught me so much about the challenges, but also the opportunities for a principal a leader to support teachers in doing innovative student-centered work. I love the idea. We're going to have an administrative point of view in this time and some of the concerns through yeah. that lens at this time. I think that's, uh, that's overdue for that conversation. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. So see you soon. Have a great all right, weekend, everybody. guys. Have a good weekend and we'll see you all Monday. Take care. Bye.